Welcome back to the Last Day Book Club and the reading of the Marked Bible, a classic story of a rebellious son, a loving Christian mother, and the transforming power of God's Word. In our last reading of chapter 11, after Mr. Anderson had made his presentation, he was detained by some of the passengers and questioned. The main questioners were Harold Wilson, Judge Kershaw, and Mr. Severance, a businessman. They had all been very touched by the presentation and wanted to know more about the Sabbath. As a result of the answers received, both Judge Kershaw and Mr. Severance experienced conversion of heart and chose to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, to keep the seventh-day Sabbath holy and make changes in their lives that such a conversion required. We continue today in chapter 12 of the Marked Bible entitled Rescue at Sea. At the close of Mr. Anderson's service in the parlor, Mr. Spaulding, in the company with Mr. Gregory, had sought a quiet place on the deck to discuss what had been said and done. They were both much agitated, though the latter was inclined to acknowledge the truth of many things he had heard. But while they talked together, Captain Mann passed near. Mr. Spaulding called out to him, Captain, just a moment of your time. I simply want to make an appeal. Can we not devise some plan to stop the further spread of this Sabbath talk? It is not producing the best results inasmuch as it stirs up the spirit of unwholesome argument, and sooner or later it may be the means of unsettling the views of some very good Christian people who are aboard. That young man with the marked Bible is already completely out of the way, and I notice that he's influencing some people whose good sense ought to shield them. You see, Captain, I'm terribly afraid of fanaticism, by their fruits ye shall know them. Well, Mr. Spaulding, you are aware that you are at liberty to plan as you wish. The freedom of the vessel is yours. But let me say to you in the brief moment that I may stop, that the young man of whom you speak, Harold Wilson, has become, during the brief period since we left San Francisco, such a splendid Christian such a trustworthy and capable co-worker that I marvel. From a profligate, a drinking, swearing, gambling, thieving criminal as I have known him, he has been transformed into the sober, praying, industrious, honest young man you behold today. This certainly must be the fruit of a good tree. And I confess that I myself have tasted and been made better. I must hasten, but let me assure you that this is something of which you need not be afraid. It is not fanaticism. There is a large amount of zeal, but it is founded on the knowledge of the Bible. No one can go far astray who studies the word in order to live it. And Harold Wilson is living it. The captain passed quickly on and into the parlor. The view that met his eyes as he entered was one which he was never to forget. There sat Mr. Severance, bowed over the table, with face buried in his hands. And as he entered, Harold Wilson, with Bible in hand, and an arm thrown over the shoulder of the merchant, was bearing witness to him of the surety of God's promise and of the wonderful blessing 
that had come to him in the truth of the fourth commandment. As Captain Man beheld the spirit manifested by Harold, the spirit of the real soul winner and helper of those in trouble, his emotions overcame him and tears filled his eyes. How strange, yet how beautiful, was this expression of tenderness in this hardy veteran of the sea. But not a word escaped his lips. He simply stepped over to Mr. Anderson, gripped his hand strongly and feelingly, and with quivering lip hastened on to duty. Woman overboard. A shriek startled the little group in the dining room, and almost immediately the cry, Woman overboard, began to sound from one end of the vessel to another. Who is it? Who is it? was on everybody's tongue, but no one knew. Two of the clergymen, Mr. Spaulding and Mr. Gregory, rushed to the opposite side of the vessel, reaching the rail just in time to see Harold Wilson emerge from the main parlor, quickly lay down his Bible, take off his coat, and plunge into the sea. Ah, how foolish! How foolish! exclaimed Mr. Spaulding. It means two lives now instead of one. No living man can handle himself in the wake of this vessel. But God help him, was Mr. Gregory's response. And God surely did help. The brave act of Harold was one of faith. And even while he battled with the waters, his thoughts went up to God for help and deliverance, and his prayer was graciously answered. His eye caught sight of a hand as it appeared for an instant above the swirling waters a few feet away, and he threw himself toward it with all the might at his command. The drowning woman's arm was now in his hand, and quickly and deftly he made sure of his human treasure and started toward the vessel. Thank God, called out Mr. Spaulding. The passengers cheered and wept. Meanwhile, Captain Mann had ordered the engines reversed and the great Tenyo Maru was brought to a dead stop. A lifeboat was lowered and Harold and the yet unknown woman were safely lifted to the deck. Mr. Gregory pressed his way to the center of the scene that he might grasp the hand of the young hero and incidentally to be of whatever service possible. But as he was about to reach for Harold's hand, the face of the rescued woman, now partially resuscitated, was before him. His face blanched, his strength gave way, and he fell heavily to the deck. It was his wife. The fate she had hoped for Harold. Mr. Wilson, said Mrs. Gregory, as she lay in her stateroom, I must tell you why I have sent for you. My husband here must know also. I was at the service yesterday in the parlor and heard Pastor Anderson discuss the Sabbath question. And while I'm ashamed to say it, I was really angry at some things that were said. I didn't like to hear them and I didn't want others to hear. And of course, I blamed you. Someone had told me that it was because of your relations with Pastor Anderson that the service was held. And when at the last I heard you say Amen, I said to myself, I wish that young upstart would fall overboard and thus deliver us from any more Sabbath talk. After the meeting I came to my room and tried to forget the whole thing, but I couldn't. So I returned after a time, 
and as I saw you still there, I was more bitter than ever. I passed the parlor door, but as I did so, my feelings overcame me. I grew dizzy. I have such spells when my feelings run away with me. And, well, I knew no more until I awakened on deck and learned that I had been delivered from a watery grave. And you, the object of my evil wishes, were chosen of God to be my rescuer. Mr. Wilson, I am begging your forgiveness, which I'm sure you will give, but I'm begging more. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible and tell me more about the truth which I've been trying to reject. Will you do it? Harold humbly acknowledged his great ignorance. He asked if she would not rather study with Mr. Anderson. Do you think he would be willing to come? She asked. Oh, I'm sure he would, was the reply. And Harold hastened to bring his good friend. Dr. Anderson, said Mrs. Gregory, I'm deeply in earnest today. And husband and I both desire further instruction. The terrible happening of yesterday was from God to correct us and make us willing to receive unadulterated teaching. Now what I want to ask is, why do you specially emphasize the question of the seventh day Sabbath? Does God require you to do it? And why is it that so many people, especially the ministers, are so determined not to listen to your message? Sister, your questions are rather broad and really require more study than the circumstances will permit. However, they are to the point, and I'm glad that the scriptures can give you an answer. Let me call your attention first to the fact that along with marriage, the Sabbath is one of the great blessings that have come down to us from the Eden home. Marriage was designed to preserve a sacred relationship between members of the human family. The Sabbath to preserve a sacred relationship between the human family and the Creator. The most casual reading of the fourth commandment shows the great purpose of the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. We find this in Exodus chapter 20, verses 6 and 11. It is the memorial of that great work. It keeps before the mind God's creative power. It calls upon us to obey Him because He is Creator. And in its service, it bequeaths to us the power necessary to overcome. True Sabbath keeping means constant surrender to God and therefore has always been the one thing that has kept man from idolatry. This is beautifully brought out in the words of Exodus 31 and verse 17. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. And Ezekiel tells us that I, the Lord, gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they may know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And this is found in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. The reason is that God, or Christ, puts himself, his own presence, into the day. 
and through its acceptance into the Sabbath keeper's heart. And thus, every Sabbath renews and strengthens faith in the Creator, a bond between God and His people forever. You will note that the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel forever. This refers not only to Jews, the mere fleshly descendants of Abraham, for they soon gave up real Sabbath keeping and therefore did not know the Sabbath as a blessing. Israel means more than Jews. The term is one that includes the true believer in all ages and down to the end of time. All Christians are spiritual Israelites. Look at Romans chapter 2 verses 28 and 29 or John 1 verse 47 or Galatians 3 and verse 29. Hence all who would be kept in the way of righteousness will keep the Sabbath and find it a sign, a memorial of His redeeming power. Creation and redemption, you see, are the same, both calling for the Sabbath memorial. Yes, brother, I can see that, said Mrs. Gregory. Isn't it beautiful? With this thought in mind, Pastor Anderson continued, it is very easy to see why the Lord has always emphasized the truth of the Sabbath. As you remember, it was the test that God brought to Israel in Egypt. You see this in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 5. It was the test just before they came to Sinai in Exodus chapter 16. And at Sinai, the fourth commandment was specially revealed. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9 and verses 13 and 14. All the commandments are important. This goes without saying. But only the Sabbath has this special quality. The Sabbath is peculiarly vital. And now note this. When the time came that God permitted his people to go into captivity, to lose their place in their nation, he told them plainly, it was because of Sabbath breaking, that is, forgetfulness of him. Compare Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 19 through 27, with 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 14 through 21. It almost makes you weep to read them both. Had they been faithful to his Sabbath, had they preserved their knowledge of him as their creator and sovereign, the Babylonians would never have carried them away. Listen to the striking words also of Isaiah, the gospel prophet. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. You find this in Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 and 14. How plain the prophet makes it, doesn't he? That all spiritual power and uplift were to be found in the Sabbath of God. I have said that Isaiah is the gospel prophet. He is. This which we have read has reference to our own gospel time. God is calling in Isaiah's message for us to turn our feet from the Sabbath, to stop trampling it on the foot. And the promise is actually fulfilled to those who obey. Brother Anderson, Harold Wilson impresses me as having found a great blessing and been deeply helped 
by this truth, said Mr. Gregory. Yes, it is obvious that he has found a remarkable blessing in it. It is only recently that he really discovered it. Really, dear people, it was what came into his soul from the Sabbath that carried him over the ship's side yesterday. He has told me this, and he is certain that God regarded his obedience and answered his prayer in his finding you. He calls you his Sabbath saved woman. I don't doubt it, not for a moment, Mrs. Gregory replied. And that is why I am really and truly opening my heart today. Many will not obey their convictions. But there is more, said Pastor Anderson. Let me continue a bit further. In chapter 56 of his book, Isaiah prophesies of a great Sabbath reform among the Gentiles of these last days. Read verses 1 through 8, and you will see that it is clearly a gospel message. It promises those who enter into a Sabbath covenant with him a place and a name better than of sons and daughters. He will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Everlasting life is involved. Surely then, someone must preach that Sabbath message at this time. Someone must specially emphasize its importance, even as God asks. Well, Brother Anderson, why is it then that the ministers, those of other denominations, do not accept these plain statements? They certainly are plain, though I never read them before, but the ministers have read them. I can tell you why some of them do not accept, said Mr. Gregory. They are a little too much as I am. They do not like to acknowledge that they have been wrong. If all the clergymen who really see the truth of this Sabbath question were to confess their convictions, there would be few left to offer opposition. I know whereof I affirm. Scores of them have privately admitted to me that Sabbath keepers are right. Well, husband, you have never said that before in my presence. I call that dishonesty. Better not say that, wife. Rather, look at it as a blindness, which for a time hinders them from reading their own motives, said Mr. Gregory. Pardon me, dear friends, said Mr. Anderson. I have not completed the study, but I am sure you are both weary. The strain of yesterday's experience has told on your strength, and you had better rest. I will therefore go. The Lord quickly restore to you your full strength. Goodbye for now. The end of chapter 12. Chapter 13 of the Marked Bible, entitled, After Nearly Dying. Husband, said Mrs. Gregory when they were alone in the seclusion of their cabin, what are you going to do about the truth of the Sabbath? A rap on the door suddenly announced a short call from Mr. Spaulding. Brother Spaulding, I'm so glad you came in, said Mrs. Gregory, for my husband and I have just been talking about a matter of personal duty, and I want to take you into our confidence. Mr. Spaulding glanced about the stateroom somewhat nervously, instinctively detecting that the matter of personal duty was one which, above all others, he would at this time avoid. His distress was apparent, particularly when he saw Harold Wilson's Bible lying near, 
which in the young man's haste had been left behind. Perhaps you have not long to stay with us, continued Mrs. Gregory, so I will come at once to my point. Mr. Spaulding's eyes seemed to be riveted on a scripture text, which as a motto for the voyage, Mrs. Gregory had pinned to the side wall of the stateroom. You see, Brother Spaulding, husband and I have been taken through the valley of the shadow, and as I consider all the circumstances, I am profoundly convinced that it was to teach me to be willing to bear my cross as the Lord Jesus would have me. I have been bitterly opposed to the idea of observing the true Sabbath of the Lord. Ever since I was a child, I have heard something ever telling me that Sunday is not the Christian's day of rest. And yesterday, that bitterness nearly cost me my life. And only the heroic act of a Sabbath keeper saved me. However, I have come to see what God wants me to do. And I mean to do it. Husband also sees. He too is convinced that the things spoken yesterday and at other times also is truth which calls for surrender on our part. My question is, and here I am treating you indeed as a confidential friend, do you not think we should both come out at once and openly take our stand in favor of the Sabbath? You are an ambassador for Christ, and I want you to give me your sincerest thought. Little did the good woman know that the day before, at the very time she was precipitated into the sea, Mr. Spaulding was seeking to persuade her husband that Harold Wilson was a menace to the Christian belief of a vast majority of the passengers and that Mr. Anderson was one who should be shunned by both ministers and people. Mr. Gregory sensed the embarrassment of the situation, and he sought to alleviate Mr. Spaulding's distress. Brother Spaulding, he said, do you not regard it as remarkable, in view of what we're discussing at the time of the accident, that Mr. Wilson should have been the one to save my wife's life? And mark you, he himself has said that the truth which has recently come to him was what gave him inspiration and faith to jump overboard and effect the rescue. Do you not look upon it as remarkable? Yes, Brother Gregory, I do. And I confess myself reproved for what I said. But you must answer my question, Brother Spaulding, Mrs. Gregory insisted. Do you not think we should both keep the Sabbath, even though it cost us everything we have in the world, when we have come to understand that God is calling upon us to do so? Mr. Spaulding acknowledges his error. Mrs. Gregory, you have placed me in an exceedingly trying position, yet you have done so unwittingly. You may not be aware that I have been strongly opposed to the Seventh-day Sabbath idea. I have regarded it as a delusion, something that was calculated to hinder the progress of the gospel in this time of great world evangelism. But to be perfectly frank, I will say that it is everyone's privilege and duty to obey his conscience. Brother Spaulding, queried Mr. Gregory, do you feel absolutely confident that you are right in the positions you have taken regarding the Sabbath? For instance, are you ready to stake your salvation on the thought that the Sabbath is not to be kept? because the law is abolished? Really, didn't Jesus honor the Ten Commandments and die to satisfy their claims? Does not the story of Calvary show that the law of the New Covenant 
the law written in the heart is the same law proclaimed from Sinai? Before God, tell me. Let us be honest with our own hearts. Well, Brother Gregory, I don't know how to analyze my position. When I read such scriptures as Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, Romans 3, 31, Romans 8, verse 3 and 4, James 2, 8 through 12, Matthew 19, verse 17, and other like passages, there does flit through my mind a bit of doubt. No, I cannot truly say I'm absolutely confident. Another question then, continued Mr. Gregory. Ought we not to regard the example and teaching of Jesus as vital? Yes, I believe we ought. Mr. Spaulding began to relax, and a spirit of freedom, which he almost unwillingly enjoyed, began to take possession of him. Well, that is my opinion too continued Mr. Gregory, and for a long time I have had in mind that if I would yield my pride and freely follow the Savior's plan, I would be a Sabbath keeper. He certainly was, yet not as a Jew. Jesus was the universal man, and therefore his Sabbath keeping was of universal import. He is my example, and I see no way to escape the conclusion that I should do as he did. A child of apostasy. You told me, Brother Spaulding, that you had been connected with one of the seminaries conducted by your people, and that you taught church history. Tell me, please, has not your study shown you that the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment was kept by the Apostles and by the Church generally for several hundred years after Christ? Is it not true that the early Church was influenced by the forms and ceremonies of ancient pagan sun worship, and that gradually she adopted the customs of the time, Sunday observance being one of them? And to make a long story short, was it not the Church fallen and corrupted, seeking for worldly position and power, that in the fourth century actually substituted Sunday for the Sabbath and compelled the recognition of it by law? Brother Gregory, you are down to real hard work now, was Mr. Spaulding's reply, and I'm going to be more than frank. I'm going to tell you what I've never breathed to a soul before, namely, that all you have said, and even more, is true. Without any doubt, Sunday, as a day of rest, is only a child of apostasy. There is not a snatch of evidence in any of the writings of the Fathers to prove that it has any claim to divine sanction. I know all of this, but I have looked at the matter from another angle. I have given respectful consideration to the thought that as Sunday was the day of the resurrection, we could properly celebrate that glorious event by worshipping on the day which witnessed it. I must say though, that if I were on my dying bed, I should not want to make any strong claim for the practice. Certainly, God never commanded it. Then tell me, Brother Spaulding, said Mrs. Gregory, how in the world could you stand before the people week after week and teach something of which you were not absolutely sure? Don't you believe the Bible? Only playing with the Bible. Sister Gregory, let me bear my heart a bit further. You have now suggested 
the real difficulty of the whole proposition. I believe I have been playing with the Word of God. I recognize that there has come into my life something which has undermined my old-time confidence. Because of compromise over the years, the Bible had ceased to be a really authoritative divine word. I have treated it in a measure as though it were from men rather than from the Lord. And on that account, I have argued just to carry my point, but not to find truth. I have done the same to some extent, said Mr. Gregory. Well, are you both intending to continue that course, asked Mrs. Gregory. It seems to me that God is trying very earnestly here today to help us all to change. And become Sabbath keepers, Sister Gregory? Mr. Spaulding questioned. I didn't say that, yet maybe that is what any true and complete change would mean. You know, Brother Spaulding, that if we do take God's word as an inspired oracle and as our only guide in living, there is no escaping the fact that we are under absolute moral obligation to obey the fourth commandment. Isn't that so? Certainly was the answer. There is not a hint of any other day divinely set apart. So far as the Bible is concerned then, the Sabbath keepers are correct, are they not? Yes, without doubt. But oh, the idea of keeping a day different from what almost the entire Christian church observes, it is that that hurts me. Why? One actually becomes the laughing stock of society. I myself have called the Seventh Day people Christ killers and fanatics. You certainly have, Brother Spaulding, said Mr. Gregory. Those were the terms you were using yesterday when we were interrupted by the cry, woman overboard. Well, I never knew before that ministers of the gospel were so unwilling to yield to what they knew to be right, said Mrs. Gregory. And do you mean to tell me that there are others in the pulpit who talk one thing and believe another? Wife, you must be patient and charitable in this matter, even though you learn of what seems to be dishonesty. I don't like to call it that. Rather, I would call it confusion resulting from long years of training in the wrong direction. As Brother Spaulding has said, he has scarcely been able to analyze his own views. We have gone on, however, teaching many times what we have not known to be true, even though we have not taught what we have known to be false. It is perfectly safe to say that the majority of ministry of today occupy this position. But the circumstances of this trip, the contact with Harold Wilson and his marked Bible, the attitude of Captain Mann, the work of Mr. Anderson, the discussions among Brother Mitchell, Brother Spaulding and me, and finally, the providence of yesterday, which has spoken so pointedly to my soul. All these have caused me to see that I must take an entirely different course. And I purpose that everybody aboard this vessel shall know what God has done for me. It was thus that Mr. Gregory, led by the Spirit of God, finally and fully committed himself. Before you go, Brother Spaulding, won't you take the Bible there and read for us? Read the 40th Psalm, please. Mr. Spaulding gladly acceded to the request of Mr. Gregory, and picking up the marked Bible, he turned to the Psalm indicated and began to read. Slowly and feelingly he read, a great tenderness taking possession of his heart. Scores and scores of times during his ministry, he had read this same scripture, 
but never before had its voice seemed to speak so directly to him or its message appeared so sweet. He reached the eighth verse and this he found underscored. In the margin was written the following, God's will is God's law. To do his will, to keep his law, is the true and only object of life. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Not wealth, not health, not happiness, not salvation, not philanthropy, but doing God's will. He who delights in the will of God has found the climax of all holiness, and he will surely be instrumental, as Jesus was, in leading others to love and serve. This is the revelation of God in man and through man. Mother. Mr. Spaulding stopped. The word mother, at the close of the note, aroused in him a peculiar interest. What does this mean, he said? Who is the mother who wrote this comment? While the words were on his lips, there was a light rap at the door. In response to the usual, come in, Harold Wilson entered. He had missed his Bible and had come for it. Sit down, my boy, said Mr. Gregory. We are just about to have prayer with Brother Spaulding. That sounded strange to Harold. And what was stranger, his Bible was in Mr. Spaulding's hand. What did it mean? Mr. Spaulding soon satisfied Harold's curiosity by explaining they had just been reading in it. And then in a gentle and fatherly way, so unlike his usual demeanor, he said, Son, what is the meaning of the word mother? signed to this note here. I'm interested, because the note sounds so much like the words of my own mother, who was accustomed also to mark her Bible. Gladly indeed did Harold relate the story of his faithful mother, of his effort to escape her influence and teaching, of the marked Bible, which he found at sea and later threw away, of his life in sin, of his trial and sentence, of the marked Bible at the Oakland Pier, marked by the request of his mother while she was on her deathbed, of Mr. Anderson's acquaintance with that dear mother, and of Captain Mann and his experience. All this, and much more, seemed to Harold a chapter stranger than fiction, and he told it as only one who believes in an overshadowing providence can. And that's why I'm trying to follow my Savior, said Harold. My mother's prayer has been answered through Mr. Anderson. The verse you have just read is my special guide. And I wrote my name under the word mother, so I could say in my heart, that I was endorsing her message. Mr. Spaulding then prayed. The Spirit of God was there to indict. As he prayed, his heart broke before God. Mr. and Mrs. Gregory shared fully his blessing of spiritual uplift, and amens sought to find expression through lips too tender to articulate. When he prayed for Harold, the hero of faith of the day before, and for Mr. Anderson, the devoted brother who sought truly to reveal Christ, Harold's cup was full. The prayer ended. Harold quietly withdrew, and Mr. Spaulding also hastened to his stateroom. But before the gong called Harold to his work, he went to Mr. Anderson's quarters and told him what had occurred in the stateroom he had just left. Thank God, said the minister, 
The day of miracles is not past. The end of chapter 13 of the Mount Bible.